John Locke and Cudworth, Jarelf Cudworth, were both born in the same county in the same generation. Both were discipled in some way by Benjamin Witchcott. Both of them loved Damaris Cudworth, albeit in very different ways. And crucially for my presentation today, both John Locke and Ralph Cudworth wrote about innate ideas. Cudworth's treatise concerning eternal and immutable morality was the most complete defense of innatism in the 17th century. While Locke's first section in his essay became the classic rejection of innate ideas. And yet, despite their parallel time, place, and love of the same woman, the two never got the chance to you know, turn and face each other on innateism. One would hope that since Cudworth began his treatise around 1662-ish, this would have given Locke decades to respond to it. Alas, Cudworth always found reasons to avoid publishing, and his treatise was only released posthumously in 1731. One would hope that the two might have met when Locke began fraternizing with Cudworth's daughter, Damaris Cudworth, in the 1680s. Alas, Locke fled England in exile, communicating with Damaris only long distance in what bordered on love poetry. One would hope that when Locke published his essay and return from exile in 1689, this could have occasioned their meeting, especially since Locke subsequently moved in with Cudworth's daughter, along with her either very understanding or very oblivious husband. <laughs> Alas, this happened in 1689, and Cudworth died in 1688. One would hope that Cudworth's unpublished manuscript would have been in Damaris' house, where Locke spent the rest of his life. Alas, it was Cudworth's son, not his daughter, who received the manuscript in his father's will. Alas, 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 the tale of Locke and Cudworth is littered with so many near misses, with these, these tantalizing moments of the two almost meeting and discussing innateism, as if history were being a tease. While many believe John Locke won the 17th century fight over innate ideas, there was no fight in the first place, or at least not the fight the people deserved for the most comprehensive defense of innate ideas in the 17th century was not published until the 18th, long past the death of Locke, as well as the expiry date for optimum readership. So today, what I intend to do is to imagine how such a meeting might have gone putting Locke and Cudworth into conversation about innateism. And this will serve as a hopefully stimulating historical speculation, as well as a philosophically interesting case study in its own right. Now, Cudworth's eternal and immutable morality argues that knowledge is not derived primarily from the senses, but from the innate capacity of the human mind. Knowledge is from within, not without. So, for example, different individuals can see different shades of color, and colorblind people can see almost none at all. This proves that color is not truly in the sensory world outside of us, but in the mind of the person that perceives it. For another example, Cudworth argues that even though animals and humans live in the same sensory world, we have very different knowledge of it, because the innate capacity of the human mind brings something to that world that is seemingly not there for animals. Cudworth writes, suppose a book were held before the eye of a brute creature. Either of them will passively receive all that is impressed upon sense from those delineations, to whom there'll be nothing but several scrawls or lines of ink drawn upon white paper. But of a man that have inward anticipations of learning in him look upon them, he will immediately have another comprehension of them than that of sense. He will see heaven, earth, sun, moon, and stars, comets, meteors, elements in those inky delineations. He will read profound theorems of philosophy, geometry, astronomy in them, learn a great deal of new knowledge from them that he never understood before, because his mind was before furnished with certain inward anticipations. 
Wherefore, this instance in itself shows how the activity of the mind may comprehend more in and from sensible objects than is passively imprinted by them upon sense. End quote. Indeed, what is, it, what is it about the human brain, as opposed to that of a mollusk, that allows us to develop the categories necessary for language, art, mathematics, religion? Since the external world of matter is the same for a baron as for a beast, then is it not the internal difference of brain capacity that makes all the difference? Thus, for Cudworth, it is the human mind that sketches the unique heights and depths of our reality, filling in its many blanks where alone perception is at a loss. Matter alone cannot provide the richness of human experience that is created by its union with mind. Now, sense experience still has its place. The material world knocks upon the mind, awakening the innate notions that slept within us all along. However, this is always a revealing, not a creating. The sense world merely reveals what was already latent in the mind all along. It simply wakes it up. Nature may be speaking to us, but we can only understand nature's speech if we already know the language, if we already have its grammar and syntax latent in our minds. All knowledge, Cudworth writes, involves the activity of mind. Knowledge is an inward and active energy of the mind itself. In contrast, John Locke does not say that. The first section of John Locke's essay concerning human understanding rejects an atheism. Knowledge comes from without, not from within. Now much of the traditional defense of innate ideas was based on certain universal truths that all humans allegedly held to. And if these truths were held universally despite different sensory experiences, then they could not come from the changing circumstances of the sense world, but had to be innate to the human mind itself, which guaranteed that all humans had these ideas in common regardless of their different sense experiences across time, place, and culture. Thus, universal consent and innateism had become partners in crime. But this <clears throat> partnership is what Locke attempts to break up. Locke protests that there are not, in fact, <sighs> such universal principles that are universally consented to, noting that children, idiots, Savages and illiterates go their whole lives without ever articulating, say, the law of non-contradiction. Such, quote, general propositions are seldom mentioned in the huts of Indians. Moving on to moral universals, Locke writes, Have there not been whole nations whom the exposing of their children and leaving them in the fields to perish by want or wild beasts has been the practice? And are there not places where, at a certain age, they kill or expose their parents without any remorse at all? There are places where they eat their own children. If ideas are innate to the human mind, why don't all humans everywhere acknowledge these universal truths? Where, oh where, asks Locke is that truth universally received. But what is interesting about Cudworth's account of innateism is that it doesn't totally rely on universal consent. Remember the example using colors? Different individuals can see different shades of color and colorblind people can see no colors at all which proves that color is not in the sensory world itself, but in the mind that perceives it. So in this case, it is precisely because the quality of color is not universal that it must be innate to the individual's mind. It is precisely because not all individuals see the same realm of lush greens and crimson horizons that color must be innate. Oddly, in Cudworth, it is often the non-universality of innate ideas that makes them valid. For while one can either be right or wrong about deep truths, 
Sense experience is not capable of being disproved, for, quote, all appearances as such are alike true, end quote. Even if an experience points to nothing objectively beyond itself, it is still true that you are having that experience. There might not be any monsters under the bed, but the experience is still just as real for the child who thinks there is. As such, for Cudworth, the lack of consensus often suggests we are onto something more real than superficial and universal phenomenon. For such experiences cannot be argued with for all appearance is alike true. In fact, by the end of the book, Cudworth is willing to dispose of universal consent altogether, writing that even if humans were discovered on other planets in the galaxy who did not agree with us on a single thing, this would still not be cause to question our innate notions. Thus, Locke's critique of universality, which is considered by many to be the battering ram of empiricism, cannot even make it to Cudworth's door. But if Cudworth's argument is not solely based on universal consent, then what is it based on? For Cudworth, it is not simply universal consent that proves an idea innate. Rather, it is because only like can know like. One can only know what is already like, and in that sense, the same as, their own mind. The mind, quote, cannot know anything, but by something of its own, that is native, domestic, and familiar to it. For Cudworth, that which is truly other and unlike us cannot be known. For if it were knowable, this would suggest some continuum between us and it, which could be traversed in order to come to know it. But then it was never truly other in the first place, for there was some common ground all along, some like terrain that could be tread to reach it. In Cudworth's words, that which wholly looks abroad outward upon its object is not one with that which it perceives, but is at a distance from it, and therefore cannot know and comprehend it. But knowledge and intellection doth not merely look out upon a thing at a distance, but make an inward reflection upon the thing it knows. And according to the etymon of the word, the intellect doth read inward characters written within itself, and intellectually comprehend its object within itself, and is the same with it. End quote. An overly simplistic, but perhaps still helpful illustration would be that of other cultures. They may seem other from us, but we can come to know and accept each other by embracing our common humanity, by realizing we aren't truly other at all. In contrast, genuine otherness would be closer to perhaps a two-dimensional entity attempting to conceive of a three-dimensional one, or a, a logical mind attempting to fathom a square triangle. Beating Kant to the punch, Cudworth lists numerous categories of the mind, including cause and effect, that sketch the limits of our reality, for how could we perceive objects in space and time unless we ourselves thought in temporal and spatial categories? Unless that which is within our mind were already like that which is outside of it. Now, Locke could here employ the same response he gave to the dispositional and immediate assent accounts. Locke could retort that if like can only know like, then this would render not only morality or basic logic innate, but the entire pantheon of knowledge as well. Must the mind have a like notion of Lincoln's death to discover he was shot in a theater on April 14th, 1865? I mean, this could go on ad absurdum, for as Locke writes, quote, by that same reason, all propositions that are true may be said to be in the mind and to be imprinted, so that if the capacity of knowing be the natural impression contended for, all the truths, all the truths a man ever comes to know will, by this account, be every one of them innate. Thus, Cudworth proves little 
by proving too much. If like knows like is true, all things would become innate, in which case innate becomes an absurd designator of nothing specific at all and is pragmatically indistinguishable from a non-innatist account. The legacy of Locke's objection continues today, for Stephen Stitch writes that such extreme innatism renders an account humdrum and is a sure sign that what may have once been an exciting thesis has now become philosophically uninteresting. Now, Cudworth's work suggests three ways he might have responded to the Lockean objection. First, while Cudworth believes qualities are innate, he does not seem to believe that quantities are. I may have an innate notion of the color blue, but it doesn't mean I know how big the waves will be tomorrow. The brain has all the puzzle pieces, but only experience can show us how they are actually put together, how all the qualities are arranged and in their quantities. Thus, not all would be rendered innate, and the contingent realms of history, science, and experiential knowledge could still have their place. But Locke could once again retort that if the principle of like knows like truly holds, then it would apply not just to qualities, but to the quantitative mixtures of those qualities. In order to allow certain types of knowledge to escape the clutch of the innate, Cudworth must defy the principle of like knows like in some small way. But if small violations are allowed, why not bigger ones? And these are difficult questions to answer, but they seem just as difficult for Locke as for Cudworth. Indeed, the same accusation could perhaps be turned back on Locke's line between primary and secondary qualities. For Cudworth argues in proto-Barclian fashion that even matter could be reduced to mental qualities. Cudworth even suggests that hell may simply be an eternity locked up in one's own mind, tormenting ourselves within the hell of our own heads. He writes, It is easy to conceive that the, the divine vengeance may make the soul its own tormentor, though there were no other hell outside it. End quote. We can thus have physically stimulating dreams and hallucinations without anything externally present, potentially reducing all primary into secondary qualities with any arbitrary line between them drawn merely for the sake of whichever empiricist or innatist system is under discussion at the time. So if distinguishing between what is in the mind and in the world is indeed a problem, it is equally a problem for both Cutworth and for Locke. Now, a second possible defense from Cudworth is that we do not innately know everything, for some things are unlike our mind, and so genuinely unknowable. If not everything is like us, then like knows like does not render all things innate, because there are things that aren't like us. Cudworth hints at this on multiple occasions, writing that we do not always know, quote, things in themselves, and that outside the realm of innateness, many things are eternally unintelligible. Thus, there are inklings in Cudworth of what could anachronistically be deemed the noumenal. And as long as there is a noumenal realm that is unlike us, the principle of like knows like need not render all things innate, thus sidestepping Locke's critique. Finally, even if these two defenses fail, Cudworth could blithely retort, so what? Indeed, Cudworth seems quite comfortable embracing an all-encompassing idealism. Locke's threat that like knows like renders everything innate is like threatening to beat the masochism out of a child. It does not have the desired effect. Cudworth seems eager to relocate reality more and more into the mind. 
And yet, while Cudworth does believe we discover truth within ourselves, this idealism does not make reality entirely relative to us. For Cudworth, knowledge is in but not of the human mind. He writes, Now the plain meaning of all this is nothing else but that there is an eternal wisdom and knowledge in the world, necessarily existing, which was never made and can never cease to be destroyed, or can never cease to be or be destroyed, or which is all one as to say that there is an infinite eternal mind necessarily existing and that actually comprehends himself, the possibility of all things and the verities clinging to them. In a word, that there is a God or an omnipotent and omniscient being necessarily existing. End quote. If all the color and juice of reality is a thing of mind, then without an everlasting mind, reality is nothing but a subjective plaything of the individual's human fancy. But this is not the case. No, reality is not relative to us. For though individual human, human minds may falter or pass away, there is an eternal mind in which all qualities of existence are eternally grounded. Indeed, Barclay's response to Locke was anticipated by Cudworth, who says, quote, There must of necessity be some one universal mind, the archetypal and exemplary cause of the whole mundane music. There must be a sun that never sets, an eye that never winks. Now, Cudworth does not think this divine idealism would negate Locke's beloved science, but rather prop it up. For, quote, men could not possibly confer and discourse together in that manner as they do, presently perceiving one another's meanings and having the very same conceptions of things in their mind, if all did not partake of one and the same intellect. Neither could one so readily teach and another learn if there were not the same ectypal stamps of things in the mind both of the teacher and the learner. End quote. So, sense on its own would make knowledge relative to divergent, divergent sense experiences, turning science into a subjective discipline. But if all minds share in a common unified source, i.e. a divine mind, then a global community of authentic conversation and commensurability is possible. This not only grounds science, but provides a commonality by which different groups can communicate, enabling, enabling innateism to have the same potential for fruitful dialogue and tolerance that is often thought to be exclusive to Locke's account. See, Locke believed it was precisely when local custom is mistaken for an innate and unquestionable truth that religious wars occur over differing innate convictions. But Cudworth maintains that since everyone's experiences are different depending on their context, we can only be united by our commonly inherited notions. So Locke believes innateism negates tolerance discussions and science. Well, Cudworth thinks that innateism is the only thing that can possibly affirm them. For otherwise, there is no innate commonality that can bridge the diversity of our unique contexts, customs, and sense experiences. For Cudworth, such a commonality must be provided by the mind of God, in whose image we are made and so commonly share in as siblings. Now, Locke could obviously retort that this divine idealism is a return to an argument from universal consent, where all share in universals through the mind of God. But there is a certain sense in which Locke also believes in universal consent. The universality of material science. Of course, this is not an innate universality, for not all cultures have practiced science or acknowledged its basic principles, yet the empiricist seems to believe that if one is properly educated in the sciences, and that these taught principles will become clear, which would be functionally indistinguishable from a dispositional innateism. The beauty of science is precisely its universality, that any person across the globe could go out 
and repeat an experiment and get the same results, a point that Locke alludes to on multiple occasions. Locke writes of such universals regarding an array of notions, including solidity, number, pure space, existence, and unity. In other places, he even explicitly refers to certain notions as garnering, quote, universal assent. Thus, both Locke and Cudworth ultimately admit some form of universality. And so, since this universality is conceptually consistent with both the innatist and empiricist accounts, it cannot be used as the deciding premise to prove one over the other. Similarly, if two applicants for a scholarship have equal grades, then grades alone cannot be the deciding factor. You have to decide based on other things, like attractiveness, financial donations, etc. <laughs> and this may actually lean in Cudworth's favor. For remember that Cudworth's argument does not need universal consent as a premise, but can merely draw the existence of universal things as an implication of his argument. No, the, the true justification for Cudworth's position does not come from universal consent, but from the powerful premise of like knows like. In contrast, empiricism often relies on universal consent as the premise for its validity, for it is precisely the ability of a scientist in Geneva to test the results of one in London that proves the alleged objectivity and supremacy of empiricism. So ironically, any critique of universal consent would be far more damning to an empiricist who relies on it as the premise for their worldview than for Cudworth, who can merely use it as an outflowing implication of the principle of like knows like. And since both accounts embrace universality, it is therefore doubly valid for Cudworth to maintain it as a concluding implication, while being invalid for Locke to use it as a premise, arguing one side over the other, for it is consistent with both accounts. In conclusion, Cudworth's use of like knows like not only provides an alternate epistemology to Locke's, but does so while possibly sidestepping the Lockean critique of universality which, as it turns out, could be turned back upon empiricism itself. Yet due to, Locke, due to Cudworth's hesitation to publish, Locke did not have the chance to wrangle with the most comprehensive defense of innate ideas in the 17th century. Had the other side of that tale been told, perhaps history would have seen that Cudworth's critique of empiricism, which reemerged in Kant's transcendental philosophy, deserved a much better hearing. Armstrong echoes this sentiment, writing, with perhaps some overstatement, that, quote, Locke's rejection of the innate idea theory is somewhat unfortunate. For if Locke had not been so adamant about innate ideas, the suggestions of Moore and Cudworth regarding the active role played by the mind could have been developed in 18th century England. As it turned out, however, this development was to wait for Immanuel Kant.